Hello, this is a short video about how to install Windows Server 2012 in Oracle's Virtual Machine VirtualBox. Um, VirtualBox developed by Oracle was originally a Sun product, but it's still completely open source after Oracle actually purchased Sun a few months ago. Actually, I think it was more than a year ago. You can download VirtualBox from virtualbox.org. I'll put all the links in the, in the notes for this video later on. Uh, we're going to be working with the evaluation copy of Windows Server 2012 here, and we can pull down the evaluation copy of Windows Server 2012 from the TechNet Evaluation Center. Again, I'll put in a, a link in the notes for specifically where to download this, either as an ISO or as a virtual hard drive. We're going to be working with the ISO, um, i.e. the actual DVD image of um, Windows Server 2012. So, I've already downloaded this, it's about 3.5 gig, uh, and it's sitting currently on my desktop right next to VirtualBox. If I boot up VirtualBox, what we want to actually do initially is create ourselves a brand new virtual machine to go and install Windows Server 2012 into. Now VirtualBox, even though it is actually an open source product, um, does have a comparable performance to uh, commercial products like, for example, VMware Workstation. Yeah, this being open source and freely available is nice for us to use just as a small test environment. So if I go to new and create a new virtual machine, I'm going to call this Windows Server 2012. We can then change the operating system version down here to Windows Server 2012, a 64-bit version. I click next on that, we can set the amount of virtual memory. Now for Windows Server 2012, it does actually have a minimum virtual memory of, or a minimum memory uh, of half a gigabyte. Now it does actually work quite well in half a gigabyte's worth of RAM, so 512 meg. Um, but you really don't want to run anything particularly intensive on that. Maybe just IIS or maybe some file and printer sharing. Um, for the purposes of this installation, I'm going to leave that as the default of 2048 meg or 2 gig. Um, it should make the install time relatively uh, relatively short. Um, if we have any virtual hard drives available to us at the moment that we've pre-created, we might have pre-created some VHD files, we might have pre-created them with disk management earlier, and I might make a video on how to do that and do a little couple of tricks with that within Windows 8 later on. Um, but for the purposes of this wizard installation through VirtualBox, we have no hard drive actually created for us at the moment. So we need to create a virtual hard drive. VirtualBox quite nicely has the ability to support lots and lots of different virtual disk images from VHD, which will be the equivalent for Microsoft's Hyper-V product to VMDK, which will be the equivalent for uh, VMware's VMware Workstation or ESX and ESXi products. Uh, we'll stick with VDI for the moment uh, just to maintain compatibility with VirtualBox. Uh, do we want a dynamically allocated or a fixed size virtual disk? The dynamically allocated disks are very, very useful for test environments because they allow us to expand uh, to a specific size. So for example, if I created a 40 gigabyte dynamically allocated hard drive uh, and installed Windows Server 2012 to it, it might only take up around about 15 gigabytes worth of space as it would be dynamically allocated later on. Uh, if I chose fixed sized at 40 gig, even though um, I have a 40 gig uh, VDI drive, if it's fixed size, it will take up 40 gig on the on the hard drive, even though there might not be uh, 40 gigs worth of data installed in it. Considering this is just a test environment, I'm going to choose dynamically allocated. If you ever do virtualization in a live environment, don't do dynamically allocated um, VHDs or VDI files. Do fixed size VDI files, as the performance does take quite a hit. For Windows Server 2012, 25 gigabytes will be just fine for me at the moment just to install the actual operating system itself. And if I hit create on that, we have now got a blank VHD. Now this blank VHD is not going to be able to power up. If I, if I turn it on at the moment, it's going to say to me, well, hang about, I need a startup disk here. I have no startup disk at the moment. All I'm going to do is go into a boot loop. It's like starting a computer with a brand new blank hard drive and has no operating system on it. So at the moment, what I want to do is I want to actually specify uh, the optical drive files that I need for this or the ISO files that I need for uh, Windows Server 2012, which was the trial version I downloaded previously. If I open that up and hit start on here, we should have this virtual machine begin to actually boot off that ISO file, just as if it would be uh, booting off a physical DVD if we popped it into the computer. 
So let's just wait for Windows Server 2012 to start up and we'll see the initial installation screens. This hasn't actually changed that much since the previous versions of Windows, i.e. Windows 2003 or 2008. Um, but it's just nice to have a look and have a see of the run through as to what looks a little bit different within Server 2012. So, <coughs> English United States and English United States for the time and currency formats. I'm going to change this to United Kingdom because that's where I am. And all we have the option here now is install now for Windows Server 2012. Uh, this installation now is not going to give us anything in regards to what you want to do for configuring the operating system. All it's actually going to really do is dump the OS uh, as a base image to the, uh, the hard drive. Um, it's actually using a file called an install.wim file. That's install.wim uh, file that's actually on this ISO to image the computer itself, a bit like a ghost image, but on a file by file basis. Uh, we'll go through that at another point uh, with an extended video with the ImageX tools and how to build custom images for Windows Server 2012. So we can see from the uh, base installation disk, it's now giving me four options. Standard edition, uh, standard edition with a GUI, data center edition server core, and data center edition with a server GUI. Um, so just like Windows 7 uh, was a big change uh, from Windows XP and Windows Vista, um, in the fact that we've now got multiple versions of the operating system existing on one single installation media, making it very, very easy to transition from standard edition to data center edition uh, if we need the extra functionality of data center edition later on, as we can just literally change a CD key inside the operating system itself, have it reauthenticate to Microsoft, reboot, and have be um, and now be um, a higher edition, i.e. data center, or maybe enterprise edition of server 2012. Uh, so at the moment I'm going to choose Windows Server 2012 standard evaluation with the GUI. I don't want server core installation. Server core installation will do a full operating install, but the server core will only actually provide you with um, a command window. It won't give you a graphical user interface. That's no start button, that's no notepad, that's no, uh, no file explorer, nothing like that at all. You've basically got PowerShell and you've got command prompt. So it's your standard edition there. Microsoft license. Now remember, read the license. So as long as you're reading that as fast as I'm reading it, that should be perfectly acceptable. But I trust everybody watching this video will have read this license correctly, printed it out, stored it for uh, future use, and has made sure to double check it with their uh, internal law. Um, Let's accept the license agreement on that to continue onwards, and we have the ability to do an upgrade or a custom installation. We can upgrade, do a complete upgrade from Windows Server 2008 R2 to Windows Server 2012, just by popping in the disk and running setup.exe, retaining all our individual files, all our individual folders, and all our individual um, applications that are actually installed on the OS. And in theory, all those applications will actually... Um, work and run perfectly happily in server 2012 if they're running in server 2008 r2 of course if you do have bespoke applications you might want to watch that because you're probably going to have a couple of problems within that um, for the moment i'm going to do a custom installation just to bring up this next little window if i do a custom installation it gives the options to go off and format the hard drives in our uh, system now i created a 25 gigabyte dynamically expanding drive if I click drive options on here, I can choose to create a new partition and I'm just going to create one gigantic partition just to fill up that entire drive on there. Uh, it creates two partitions for me then, one for the actual installation and one for the system partition for the recovery partitions uh, that Windows Server 2012 requires. And if I click next, that's going to start copying the Windows files and actually get those files ready for installation. I'm just going to pause um, for the moment and we'll come back to that in a second. Okay, so the files have finished installing and the first thing presented with, presented with sorry, uh, afterwards is to enter your password. Uh, this will actually be the local administrator password, so make this pretty strong. Uh, but whatever you do, don't make it the same as your domain administrator password. I've made that mistake a few times myself. Um, the reason why you shouldn't actually make it the same as your demand administrator password is what I'm about to show you right now. 
If I click on to machine and insert controller delete here, we get to the sign in page. Now you can see here we've got administrator and we can sign in with administrator PAWW0RD, which is the password I've set, which is a standard Microsoft admin password just for all your lab exercises. This will actually be logging me into the local administrator account. Um, if you're from the 2003 era and you haven't been through the 2008 and 2008 R2 era, you may not have seen this previously, um, but if this was actually joined to a domain, if I want to type in administrator and the, and, um, the PA$W0RD password that I've just entered, and this was the same password as my domain admin account, it would actually log me in as local administrator by default. I'd have to actually have to type to get to my domain administrator account, the name of my domain, backslash, administrator so maybe for Microsoft examples Contoso backslash administrator or a datum backslash administrator or fabricam backslash administrator uh, Microsoft have got a lot of these uh, test um, domains that they've actually bought themselves there is a Wikipedia article for it uh, as well so if I just log in there with the local administrator there we go, we have now got Windows Server 2012 installed, pretty painless, into VirtualBox, and the first thing you'll see launch is the brand new server manager. A couple of things about Windows Server 2012, it does operate in the same way as uh, Windows 8, so you'll notice there is no start button down there, and we actually have to go down to the bottom left hand corner to click on start to bring up our start screen here. Everything else really is administered through this brand new server manager and we'll go through the server manager later on and we'll create another video for that. What you might notice is that it's a bit choppy within this virtual machine and my mouse is jumping all over the place in comparison to actually natively here. This is because we've had no guest editions actually installed in this. To improve compatibility with the virtual machine, VirtualBox, like many other virtualization platforms, actually has third-party software available uh, to us to be able to install it into a virtual machine to improve the compatibility of that virtual machine's operating system with um, the virtualization software itself. So to do that, all I need to actually do is come up here into devices within my current window and go to install guest editions. When I install guest editions, if I minimize server manager, it should mount for me um, a new disk. There we go. So the CD drive D uh, now has actually had the ISO file removed from it, which is the installation ISO for Windows Server 2012, and it has the VirtualBox guest editions ISO added in there. If I just double click on this and run the setup for AMD 64, because we're emulating a 64-bit operating system here, do a next, next, next installation for it, and these um, VirtualBox guest editions will be installed and will improve compatibility with the virtual machine itself and the virtualization software. Take note, Direct3D support here, uh, we can technically run 3D games and emulate Direct3D within virtual machines. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. it, it does work, but it doesn't work particularly well. So we'll just wait for this to install. We do want to actually always trust software from Oracle Corporation, we'll install that. This is because VirtualBox is trying, or the VirtualBox guest editions, is trying to install um, driver software into the system, and Windows Server 2012 uh, will only actually take signed driver software. Since that driver software was signed by Oracle, it was just asking us, do we trust the Oracle Corporation, and do we want the Oracle Corporation to be able to install things onto our system? Once that's completed, I'm going to reboot on it. This shouldn't take too long to actually uh, reboot for us and we should hopefully see that the compatibility uh, and the day-to-day -day usage of this operating system will be improved. There we go. Control or delete that. Log back in again. And we are now into Windows Server 2012. And we should be able to see that integration has improved and my mouse speed has improved quite considerably. This also improves the performance of the virtual machine overall, not just the visual performance as well. And we should be able to see that there is the VM VirtualBox guest edition starting up with the computer itself. Okay, and that's how to install Windows Server 2012 
into Oracle VirtualBox. If we want to turn this off, we can choose to send an ACPI shutdown. And this actually sends a shutdown signal into the virtual machine itself to shut it down and close it 